So I've put together this virtual birch aquarium tour from footage that I've taken there in past years with my classes. Not exactly the same as actually seeing the live animals in person, but this is the best we can do in our shelter in place semester. I'll try to put things together in roughly the same sequence that you would see them as you work your way through the whole of fishes. And I'll tell you some of the same things that I sometimes share with any students that are around when we're looking at a particular tank. I'll ask you questions too as we're going along, just as I would with students during a normal semester's birch trip. It's not the same, of course, particularly because when you actually observe animals in an aquarium tank, it's never this boom, boom, get the facts and done, though I suspect that's the kind of feel this video will have. I'm able to share with you only a few seconds of video that I've saved on my phone. I'm hoping that you'll follow up on this lesson at some point by going to an actual aquarium. It doesn't have to be the birch. In fact, the Aquarium of the Pacific and Long Beach and, of course, the Monterey Bay Aquarium are outstanding. Okay, so we've gathered a few students in the main entryway now, and as you walk in to your right, near the entrance to the Hall of Fishes, there's a cylindrical tank with lots of silvery fish. And we're going to spend some time there. The featured species in this tank is the Pacific sardine. Although there are usually one or two other species that look superficially like the sardines, but can be easily distinguished on closer inspection. These fish don't stay still. They're always moving. But fortunately, with a miracle of video, I can slow down or even freeze when I need to, to point something out to you. I can't do this in real life, but I'm going to take full advantage of this here. In last week's fish dissection lab, the sardine was one of the species. You might remember its large heart, large proportion of dark muscle, and fine hair-like gill rakers, all things consistent with its ecology as an open water filter feeder that swims forward continually in schools. You can see this clearly at this tank. Lots of the silvery sardines swimming around and around in the same direction. Since we all keyed out the sardine last week, you'll also know that it has no lateral line and a few black spots along its side. It also has the more primitive non-acanthomorph anatomy with only soft dorsal rays, abdominal placement of its pelvic fins, and large cycloid scales, all things you can see in the fishes that swim by. You might also note that swimming forward, their mouths are either open just a little bit or they gape wide. That gaping wide might be associated with either feeding or simply clearing out the gills with extra pressure. But swimming forward with the mouth open just a bit is what keeps pressure in the mouth cavity, pushing water across the gills and out the gill openings. This is what kind of ventilation? Okay, now we're going to take a look at another fish species that thinks it's getting away with impersonating a sardine because its shape and silvery color are about the same. Only when you look closer at this fish, it has dorsal spines and soft rays, but no finlets, thoracic placement of the pelvic fins, and tiny tenoid scales. It's clearly an acanthomorph, but it's not one of the fishes we keyed out in last week's lab. This is the jack mackerel, Trachurus symmetricus, also known as a Spanish mackerel or Spanish jack. And only this last name is accurate in acknowledging that this is not a mackerel at all, but a fish from the jack family, Carangidae. This is the family for which the Carangiform swimming is named, and typically Carangids, that is jacks, have that characteristic narrow cylindrical caudal peduncle and a stiff sickle-shaped tail. Now the tail on this fish is not too sickle-shaped, but the caudal peduncle is definitely narrow, and the fish's swimming is Carangiform. Now what about the sardines? Take a closer look. Going by morphology, sardines have that narrow caudal peduncle and a stiffer, thinner tail than most fishes that we'll be characterizing later as subcarangiform swimmers, although they may not be quite as stiff-bodied as the jacks. Personally, 
I would put them somewhere in between subcarangiform and carangiform. And there's nothing wrong with a fish not being strictly placeable into one or another category. Sardines have their place in California history. Back in the heyday of the Monterey Bay fishery, before Monterey was a tourist destination, commercial fishermen made good livings by harvesting what seemed to be an infinite supply of free protein in the form of sardines. Most of what they caught was dried and ground into fish meal and then fed to livestock, mostly meat chickens, to make them grow and reach marketable size in fewer weeks than they would with a strictly grain-based diet. Then, in the 1960s, the sardine populations collapsed, causing the Monterey Bay fishermen to lose their livelihoods. Some moved on, some found other jobs, but the rebirth of Monterey as a home to an awesome aquarium and some other cool touristy attractions is a comparatively recent thing. The crash of the sardines may have been due largely to overfishing, but there's also evidence from the shell middens of the true California natives that sardines fluctuate in abundance anyways, even without the overfishing. Cycles of great abundance alternate with near absence of sardines, and we'll talk about this in the last unit of our class. Now we can finally enter the Hall of Fishes, and to our right, there's a tank with a giant sunflower sea star, wolf eels on the bottom, under a simulated shipwreck, and some rockfish. By rockfish, I mean any of the many species in the genus Sebastes, of which we keyed out, sort of, the vermilion rockfish last week. The two seen here are, I think, copper rockfish, also known as a chucklehead, which is the one flaring its dorsal fins, and a bocaccio. That one is somewhat bigger. Okay, start out with the shape of the caudal peduncle and tail. What does this tell you about how this fish is going to swim? Sure, it's not really swimming a lot in this confined space, but with its relatively streamlined body shape and the flat caudal peduncle and fan-like tail, you know that it can only be a sub form swimmer. Second thing to note is that these fish have what kind of buoyancy? They evidently aren't having to work much to keep themselves from either floating up to the surface or sinking. So this is neutral buoyancy. And it clearly indicates the presence of what organ that we saw last week. All right then, in the sardine tank, the fish were using ram ventilation to keep water moving across their gills. This is obviously not happening with these rockfish. Why? Well, if they were swimming forward, then they could and probably would be using ram ventilation. But staying still, suspended, almost motionless in the water, means that the fish must generate a pressure gradient with the muscular pumping using its buccal chamber. Water is drawn in through the mouth when the chamber expands in volume. Then when the walls of the buccal chamber close inward, the pressure increases, pushing water out through the gill openings. What's especially nice about these fish in particular is that you can see the oral valves inside the mouth opening and closing in response to changes in pressure in the buccal cavity. When the chamber expands and the buccal pressure drops, the valves are open as water flows in through the mouth. When the boccaccio pushes on the water, causing the pressure to increase in the mouth cavity, these valves close, preventing backflow through the mouth opening so the water has nowhere to go except out across the gills. What's neat is the way that all this muscular and skeletal activity inside the head is happening without a whole lot of movement that you can detect by watching the fish's head from the outside, although you can see the effects of the pressure changes by observing the oral valve. If you turn around now and look at the tank opposite of the one we were just at, there are a couple more display tanks with animals from colder waters of the north coast. The only footage I have from the first tank is this little flatfish. At first, all you can see is its eyes sticking out from the sand, and then it pops up and swims for a bit. But how would you characterize this kind of swimming? 
flatfish like the spotted turbot, or if you prefer, turbo, are asymmetrical on the right-left axis, with one side having both eyes, pigmented skin, and a thicker layer of muscle. They lie on their sides and swim sideways. But if you saw the same kind of swimming only vertical instead of sideways, it would be regular old subcarangiform swimming, right? Now, in the other display tank to the right, you've got a pretty large assortment of vertebrates and invertebrates. Let's go with ones without backbones first. There's the purple sea urchin, Strongliocentritus purpuratus, with its shorter bluish purple spines, as compared with the red sea urchin, Strongliocentritus franciscanus, which you can see behind the purple dude. Franciscanus sea urchins prefer deeper water, and this is the species sought after by many commercial fishermen for the uni trade. And speaking of delicious seafood, there are abalones in this tank as well. Now, which phyla and classes do sea urchins and abalone classify into? Now take a look at the frisky little fish, painted greenlings, I think. It has hexagramids, which is the same family as lingcods. They lack swim bladders entirely. Now is this fact consistent with what you're seeing here? Why? Besides the greenlings, sea urchins, and abalones, there are bat stars and sea anemones that are easily spotted. What phyla and classes do they belong in? And then there are these wolf eels, which are not eels at all. True eels are in the anguillidae. Anguilla is Italian for eel, and in Spanish I think it's anguilla, sometimes being bilingual helps when it comes to learning Latin names. The weird thing is that true anguillid eels, we'll see the moray shortly, are in a basal clade of bony fishes, the elopomorpha, which includes tarpon and bonefish. Neither of these are eel-like in the least. Wolf eels are definitely eel-like, but completely unrelated. They're actually in the Persiformes, which is out there among the crowniest of the crown acanthomorphs. Wolf eels and moray eels, and a few other kinds of fishes, have converged on a snake-like body plan and anguilliform swimming as a reasonably good way of getting around, and a really good way of making use of crevices and little caves in a reef-like bottom structure. Next display to your right is the giant Pacific octopus, which is usually just sleeping in a corner of its dark tank. When it does move around some, people get really excited. Now across the corridor in the next tank, there's a community of inshore fishes, including some surf perches and other fishes that are not surf perches. See if you can tell the difference. Surf perches use primarily fin swimming with their pectoral fins to maneuver around the tank casually, but subcarangiform body swimming to power swim, as when chasing away a competitor or fleeing from a predator. The other fishes in the display won't be showing this kind of pectoral fin swimming, even when they're casually bumping around the tank. Another neat thing about surf perches is that they're unusual among marine fishes in bearing a relatively small number of large young. The babies are nourished by the mother directly inside and are born live. This has the effect of greatly reducing the total number of offspring that a mama fish can produce at any given time. We'll talk about this when we discuss life history strategies later. Right next to the tank with the surf perches, there's a dark tank containing some Pacific seahorses, the kind found locally, like in San Diego Harbor. These fishes share the same order, gastrosteiformes, with pipefishes, shrimpfishes, and sicklebacks, and they classify within the crown clade of bony fishes, the canthomorpha, although, like the wolf eels we saw earlier, they've gone their own way and largely have highly derived morphologies not at all displaying those easy-to-recognize traits that I pointed out to you last week, 
and also earlier today at the sardine tank. There are a couple things you can take note that are evident in this video clip. First is the way this fish uses its dynamic mouth cavity to create a powerful suction, which you can see it deploying at the start and ends of this video clip. Second, no part of the seahorse's body is swishing back and forth. It seems to be moving around the tank by magic. But then, looking more closely, you can see that thin, transparent pectoral fins right behind the head. They're undulating like crazy. It's able to stop and go, hover and maneuver, just like a hummingbird. You can also see down here that there's a dorsal fin that's also undulating continually. The tail of the seahorse is used mostly to grab onto things and to anchor the fish in place. Across the quarter from the seahorses, there are a couple of super cold tanks that usually have a lot of condensation on the glass. One is a community tank with lots of invertebrates. Long tentacled tube anemones, basket stars, a warty sea cucumber, as well as urchins, sea stars, and smaller colonial anemones are on display. And in the next tank, there's a funny little fish, a spiny lump sucker. Its maximal size is a bit smaller than a ping pong ball, and that's more or less the general body shape as well. With a nearly spherical body and a relatively short caudal pedicle and tail that seem to beat furiously as the fish swims, some students mistake this for thuniform swimming, which it is totally not. Sure, only the rear of the fish is beating, but the tail is fan-shaped, and this is certainly not the epitome of biomechanical efficiency, which is the case for true thuniform swimmers. Oddly, the lump sucker lives in rocky marine habitats where there are powerful currents during tidal surges, and it's able to manage this because of its highly derived pelvic fins, which have been modified to form a suction cup, allowing the little fish to anchor itself to rocks and not get swept away by the currents that are too swift, even for strong swimming, bigger fishes. Another example of a similar structure occurs in the remora. Only here, it's the spiny dorsal fin that undergoes modification and repurposing to form the suction device. And I'm totally cheating here. There is no remora on display at the birch. This footage is from a different aquarium. Moving on, there is a series of jellyfish on display next. Jellies, as they are properly called, require special tanks that are set up in a way that won't suck the animals up into the filtration or circulation systems. One of the most common jellies locally is the moon jelly, Aurelia arita, which is mostly pretty harmless. Like most of our local sea anemones, they have stinging cells, but the little harpoons that are shot into your skin by the nematocysts, they're not too venomous, and they're mostly too short to reach your nerve endings. Not so in the case of the sea nettle, which is also pretty common, but it will cause a painful lesion. Moon jellies, which are Nidarian in the class Scyphozoa, this is a class containing most medusas, are not always medusas throughout their whole life history. They actually start out their predatory life as sessile polyps, that encrust hard surfaces and then butt off their heads, which form mini medusae. At the birch, they have this tank that has what looks like a square panel covered in slime. And most people don't give this a second look. But if you do, when you go to the birch, you'll probably see the tentacled heads of the little polyps. And drifting around in the water around the panel, you may see tiny medusae looking like little umbrellas opening and closing, but with ribs only, no fabric. There might be some other jellies on display, and maybe even a comb jelly from the phylum Tenophora. These comb jellies have traditionally been classified together with the Cnidarians in the Radiata. They are jelly-like and diploblastic, but having only two sides, it's not clear if they're radial, like a Mercedes emblem with only two parts instead of three, or bilateral. Not everybody is happy with this classification of Tenophora within the radiata. Uh, tenophores, it turns out, might even be the most basal of all animals, 
even to the sponges. And this would be a real pain for me to have to explain to students. And so I'm hoping that this particular model turns out to be wrong. There are a couple of more interesting Nidarians to talk about before I wind up this video, which I'm going to follow up with the second half of our virtual birch tour. Before getting to the big kelp forest display, you come to a couple of small tanks, one of which has a red gorgonian, a small branching tree-like structure that looks more plant-like than animal. But the red branches are covered with tiny white polyps. This is a colonial anthozoan. Earlier I mentioned the Scyphozoa, which is the class in the Cnidaria that's mostly medusa-form animals. The Anthozoa is the other big class, consisting of sea anemones and corals, polyp-bodied Cnidarians. Gorgonians are classified within the subclass Octocorellia. They are our local coral animals, and although they're not big reef builders, they do make a nifty little tree-like structure that provides anchorage and access to food to the hundreds of animals comprising their colony. Another colonial anthozoan is in the next tank, the sea pansy. This weird little thing looks like a leaf-shaped piece of purple leather that anchors itself on a sandy bottom with a structure that looks like the petiole of a leaf. It too has many tiny white pulps on its surfaces. These are both really cool marine animals that few Californians are even aware of. My computer's been glitching out really bad. These last five minutes of video have caused multiple crashes, and I think it's because of the memory demands of this video-intensive file. So I'm going to finish this video here, and I'll pick things up again with hopefully a less burdened CPU.